Open your Bibles with me, if you will, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 10, or chapter number 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, and the series is Satan and the Unseen World. And the message today is God's, or, or the war on the saints. Satan and the Unseen World, that's the series I'm going to do throughout the month of October uh, at least at this point. And then the war on the saints is the message today. The war on the saints. Will you stand, please? We begin reading in verse 10, Ephesians chapter number 6. The Bible says, finally, brethren, and Paul is finishing up this wonderful letter here to the Ephesian church. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. The word wiles is the idea of strategies or the methods of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So this is the theme today, the war on the saints. We, saints, God's people, Christians, the born again, We are in a match, a war, a wrestling, and it's not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness or wicked spiritual beings who are in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Thank you, and you may be seated. Verse number 12 is teaching us something here that is so critically important. It is that as you sit in this building right now, there's a war raging about you. A war on the saints. Because Satan is not primarily interested in the unsaved. His focus is upon the saints. If he can cause you to doubt, to stumble, to turn back from serving the Lord, to be tempted into sin, and uh, to call you away from the Lord's will in your life, if he can do that, that's a greater victory to him. He doesn't need to really worry a great deal about unsaved people. They don't have the Holy Spirit living within them. And so unsaved people are prey to their own flesh and to the world around them. That takes care of that. So Satan's focus is on you. Now, I want you to get that today. I don't want you to miss that. The focus of Satan is on believers. It's on Christian people. We think otherwise. We think of Some drunk fellow down in the gutter somewhere, he's under the control of Satan. No, I doubt Satan cares much about him. Satan is interested in you, the guy sitting in church on Sunday morning that has the potential to damage his influence in his kingdom. And so the war is on the saints. The war began when Satan, the most powerful of all the angels, the one at the top of the hierarchy, if you will, led a rebellion against God. He did it in heaven. It didn't occur here on the earth. It was in heaven. The rebellion was against God's authority, against God himself. And that war continues until today. It is never abated. It's never slowed. It's just as it's always been. What does the Bible teach about Satan and the forces of darkness, the forces of evil. I think there is a tendency in two extremes when we deal with the doctrine of Satan. And the extremes are this, that there are those who overplay it. I particularly see this. I watch TV programs, listen to some pastors on the radio, and particularly those who come out of one school of thought. They see a devil behind every bush. And they're always talking about casting out demons of people, and the way that they teach it is unscriptural. 
They, they talk about uh, calling the demon of sickness out of somebody. Somebody says, I got a headache. Well, then they want, they're going to rebuke the, doctor, or the, the devil of, of headaches. The Bible doesn't teach that. That's an overplaying of the doctrine. The other tendency, I'm afraid, is in our camp, and that's to downplay teaching about the devil. I, to my, maybe, maybe not to my credit, have not taught a lot about Satan. I, I reference him all the time. I don't like to preach a whole series. I've kind of held back from doing what I'm beginning today. It's a dark subject. It's not one pleasant for me to spend my life for a week or more studying on, and yet I think the Bible talks about it so much. There's so many references. It's not right for us to neglect any passage of Scripture. The Bible says we're to preach the whole counsel of God, doesn't it? And if we preach the whole counsel of God, there's a lot of references that deal with Satan and the works of darkness. So we've got to preach and teach those. I heard a pastor actually say words like this, just focus on the gospel preachers, win souls and preach Christ. Don't worry so much about the devil. Well, that gives the devil a great opening because if we're blind to him and his devices, then we can have great problems, of course. And no part of the Bible ought to be downplayed. So we began today this series with that in mind. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6, if you want to write down some references here as we go through this, and you'll have the scriptures I've used. Hosea 4 and 6, the old prophet said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is not harmless. Ignorance will do you in. You need to know what the scripture says about whatever topic we're talking about My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I want to try and help you have knowledge of the war on the saints. Let's begin. Number one, if you're outlining with me, I want to talk about the fact of the spirit world. The fact of the spirit world. When we open our Bible, we are confronted with two realities that the Bible talks about. There is the world that you would call the real world. It's not any more real than the other world, but for whatever reason, we use that to talk about the material or physical world. And so people reference the real world. They mean the physical material world. That world is governed by natural law. We call natural law, in total, we call it science, and it refers to science. The laws of science govern the material world. It's the world of the senses. And so if I can see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, feel it, it's real to me. But if it's beyond that, then I say, well, it's not the real world. That's certainly contrary to what the Bible talks about because the physical material world is no more real than the spiritual world. And we think about the spiritual world, we're, not, we're talking about the world that is beyond our senses. So the spirit world, I don't smell it, taste it, touch it, see it, hear it, feel it. It's beyond that. It transcends the laws of science. You know, scientists had no problem believing in the spiritual dimension, the spiritual world. They had no problem. They wrote about it, read about Sir Isaac Newton, who was a great Bible teacher, a great, great science, scientist. It wasn't until Darwin came along, and after Darwin, the scientific world moved away from the Scripture. But uh, sadly, sadly so, because until then, the scientists believed in the spiritual world, and many of them, of course, if they're Christians, still do. Now, there are a lot of anecdotal testimonies where people give a testimony about thus and thus happening, you know, and it's usually some story that's sort of spooky, sort of a ghost story type thing. And people will tell those kinds of stories, but we can't validate those. I hear those and I think, well, it might have happened. It might not have happened. I don't know if it happened or not. 
because it's just anecdotal evidence. It does it doesn't have any empirical evidence. It can't be repeated. You can't put it in a lab. It it uh, nobody can test it. So I'm just either believe the person's testimony or I don't believe the person's testimony. And their story, these stories of how the spiritual world, the spirit world interacts with the physical world. And we know that it does at times. We see that in the Bible. But I can't give you any proof empirically, we would say, that uh, the spirit world is, is in fact real. My evidence for the spirit world is to me stronger than anything I could say scientifically. It's the Word of God, the Bible. If the Bible says it, it is valid. We believe it. If we are believers, if we're Christians, and so the strongest evidence for the spiritual world is what we read in the Bible, divine revelation, we call it, the Word of God. It says 2,000 times in here, the Word of God, or thus saith the Lord, Either God is the biggest liar in the universe or he's true. You have to decide that. I've decided that God's word is true. So I can't prove every part of it because what I'm talking about today transcends my senses, the sensory world, the physical world. John Milton, the blind poet who authored the one of the classics of all English literature, the Paradise Lost and then later Paradise Regained a wonderful Christian man. He said, millions of spiritual creatures walk the earth unseen, both while we wake and while we sleep. Millions of spiritual creatures walk the earth unseen, both while we wake and while we sleep. That was the view of all of civilization, world, uh, Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian world until the last, oh, 100, 150 years. So let's begin really basically. What is a spirit? What is a spirit? If I came to you and said, give me a definition of a spirit, what would you, what would you say a spirit is? Well, there's a lot of different semi-definitions. I tried to give you as conclusive a one as I could. A spirit is a living, conscious invisible, immaterial. It's not material. You can't touch it or see it. A spirit is a living, conscious, invisible, immaterial being, but it has all the marks of personhood. What, is, what are the marks of personhood? We use that when we uh, talk about abortion sometimes, defining is a is an unborn baby a person? What are, what are the marks of personhood? Well, a person has intellect. It's not just a force, an impersonal force of some kind. A person has a mind. And so a, a person has knowledge. Does this, do the spirits have knowledge? Yes, they do. A person has emotion. They feel, they hate, they get angry, they love. Do spirits have emotion? Yeah, you see the devil get angry, the Bible talks about. He stays in a perpetual state of anger, it would appear. A person has a will, and the will is the part of me that can choose between going right or going left. A will is the part of me that chooses. Animals live off of instincts. They live off of conditioned response, responses. Animals live off of uh, training that they've had or just natural biological urges. But we choose. We have that God-given ability to make a choice. People don't, oh, I wish we could just stop and preach for an hour on that and talk about the importance of the will. In fact, that's the basis of your salvation experience, isn't it? Whosoever will may come. If you're a Christian, there had to be a day when you said, I will to be believe in Jesus Christ. I choose. If you're a, an unbeliever, you say, I reject the story of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. So persons have mind, emotion, and will. Spirits have the same. 
They have all those marks of personhood. Now, let me contrast it in another way. You believe in non-material, spiritual forces, if you will, but they're not personal. How many of you believe in gravity? Sure, everybody in here. If you don't, don't ever get on a building and jump. Now, we all believe in gravity, do we not? We know that gravity is a fact. Has anybody here ever seen gravity? You ever smelled gravity? Ever heard gravity? Touched gravity? What's the other one? I've heard of whatever it is, five of them. I've already said it ten times. Now I can't remember it. You've never, there's no physical evidence in that sense. You don't sense gravity. And yet you believe in it, don't you? You know that it's real. It's de demonstrable. It's proven. I could say the same thing about magnetism. You believe in magnetism, don't you? You can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, feel it. It's, it's true of many things, but they're, they're forces. They're non-personal. They're not, they're not, they don't have mind. Gravity doesn't have mind or intellect or will. You've got to understand this if you're going to understand the spirit world. Do you know right now in this room, there's probably a hundred different preachers preaching. You don't see them unless you had a radio device or unless you have a, a TV monitor or something. And it picks up the waves that are in this room that right now are invisible, but they're here. They're preaching. There's sports programs going on in this room. There's newscasts going on. It's whatever's on television, radio is in this room. And it's non-personal. It's a force, but it's a reality. It's here. All you need is the instrument to pick it up, the device. Now, Spirit be beings are invisible and non-material, but they're personal. They have a mind, they have emotion, they have will. And they interact with the physical world sometimes. For example, they assume visible form. The angels materialize. They actually became visible to certain people in the Bible. Spirits were created by God Unlike human beings, they are not born through normal reproductive ways. They were created, I believe, all on the same day at one time. They were created. They don't reproduce. Jesus said, in heaven we'll be like the angels who are not reproducing. The angels don't reproduce. And also, the spirit world, they don't die. So you've got a tremendous change between spirit beings and human beings, as it were. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll start with looking at angels, because angels are the spirit beings that the devil came from, the demonic forces came from. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 7, and of the angels, he said, God said, who maketh his angels spirits? Ah, right there. Draw you a little mark around that. So that tells me that angels are spirit beings, non-material beings. And his ministers, and the word minister means servants. The angels were created. They are spirit beings created by God to minister, to serve and uh, they're his ministers of flame of fire. So many times they appeared in fire. Go down to verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits? Spirits that God made. He sent them forth to serve for them who will be the heirs of salvation. The heirs of salvation are you and me. So the angels were God's messenger servants that he created for the purpose of serving his people and serving him. This is who that Bible defines the angels as being. Go back with me to Job chapter 38 in your Bible for a moment, and we'll begin reading in verse number four, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And so these are the words again, literally of God. 
Job 38 and 4, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it if you have understanding. Who hath laid the, found, the, laid the measures thereof, if you notice? Who's ever measured the earth? Who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars, circle stars there, that's angels. Same word is used many times in the Bible. Stars, angels, same word translated. When the morning stars, when the angels sang together and all the sons of God, there's another reference to angels, they shouted for joy. In other words, the angels call the sons of God here and call the stars of God here, were present at the creation morning. So they preceded the creation of the earth itself. When were they created? When did the spirit world come into existence? It appears before creation itself, before physical creation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, I won't turn there. It tells us how many there are. It says there's an innumerable company an innumerable company, innumerable, so much we can't even count them. Billions, no doubt. Billions of angels and uh, spirit beings that God created. And they have such power. In 2 Kings chapter 19, one angel destroyed the entire Assyrian army of 185,000 people in one night. They have power beyond our comprehension. Not like God but next unto God. And so you can see, a l- I'm, I'm just giving you a little tidbit of angels. There's so much in the Bible about angels. But the greatest and most powerful angel ever created was Lucifer. He was the top dog, if you will, among all the created beings, angels, spirits that God created. He was a cherubim. That's the highest order of angels in the Bible, the cherubim. It seems that he served at the very throne of God himself. And we're going to look at all those verses tonight and get a lot of information about Satan that I don't have time to give you this morning. But it seems that he served at the very throne of God. There are references in the Bible to him being in the stones of fire and in the mountain of God. And those are references to the immediate presence of God. I mean, he's right up there with God. He's one of God's staff, if you will. He is a personal in personal contact with God. And he became the devil when he sinned. He made a choice. You see, angels have the power of choice. Spirit beings have the power of choice. They can make choices. And he made his choice. And his choice was to rebel against God. Pride welled up in his heart. He became so fascinated by his own beauty Be careful if you're beautiful or handsome. He became so enthralled by himself that he actually began to think in his pride that he could defeat God. And he led a rebellion against God. And the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot about it, but it lets us know about it. Go to Revelation with me. Revelation chapter 12. And Revelation, as you know, is a panoramic book, it deals mostly with the future, but sometimes it goes back to the past. And in Revelation chapter 12, and in verse number 4, well, we'll start in verse 3, it goes backward, back at the fall of Satan. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. That's the devil. Mark it in your Bible. And he's pictured as having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. That's symbolic language, of course. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. There's the stars again. But look it up in your uh, Hebrew and Greek. It's angels. His tail drew the third part, one-third of the angels who were in heaven that God had created to be his messengers and did cast them to the earth. And if you'll go then down, let's see, to verse number, uh, verse number seven, and there was war in heaven. Michael, one of the three archangels and his angels, 
fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon fought, and his angels wore in heaven, and the dragon prevailed not. Neither was there place found in heaven anymore, and so he was cast out of heaven down to the earth. There's a lot we'll be talking about in the future messages about that passage. I don't have time for it today. I just want to give you the overview, the big picture here, so you'll get a real picture of the, the spirit world itself. Now, one of the ultimate questions we deal with, though, in life if you are a thinking person at all, at some time in your life, you have to think about this. Where did evil come from? Where did all the bad things that we think about that we see, where did it come from? Because the Bible repeatedly tells us God is good. God is righteous. God is holy. God is loving. God is kind. And then we look around us and we see all this evil that just absolutely controls everything, it seems. Look at the world around you today. You think evil or, do, or good dominates? Well, it depends on where you are and who you ask and when, but there's a lot of evil in there. Where did it come from? If God is a good God, why did he allow so much evil? You have the answer right here. Evil originated, sin originated, in the heart of Satan, when he became lifted up by his pride, and boy, pride is so deceitful. If you have pride in your life, you better deal with it. Pride always goes before a fall. Pride in Satan's heart may, deceived him into thinking he was greater than God. Look, he didn't, he didn't open that rebellion because he thought he was going to lose. He believed he was greater than God, and he could convince the angels, and they would defeat God, and he would become the God of the universe. He would sit on the throne. And he found out he did convince one-third of those angels, so he must really be something. He convinced a third of the angels to follow him. Angels have a free will. They made the choice, and they followed Satan. And that was a bad day for the angels, wasn't it? Now, those angels, look in the little book of Jude. You're in Revelation. Just turn back a few chapters and go to the book of Jude, the little book right before Revelation. Go down to Jude, verse 6. The angels which kept, their not, kept not their first estate, that's their position. The angels who turned away from what their original purpose in God creating them was. They turned away from it. They left their habitation, and now they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. So where did demons come from? Demons are the fallen angels, the third of the formerly good angels, righteous angels, that made the decision to follow Satan. So when you have an angel of righteousness, one of God's angels, you have a counterpart, only one-third as many. And the counterpart is what? Demons. Or the Bible, the King James Version, often calls them devils in the plural. And so... Where did evil come from? From the heart of Satan and his pride when he thought literally he could overturn Almighty God. He led one-third of the angels to follow him. He had great influence. And those angels became the demons that still exist that plague the world today. When did that happen? The Bible really doesn't tell us specifically, but you can sort of see it implies at the end of Genesis chapter 1, it says God saw everything and it was good. Now, maybe he was just talking about the creation, but it's a general term. And it might mean, I think it probably means that sin had not yet entered into Satan. But you come over to Genesis chapter 3 and Satan has become evil. He's become the de Lucifer has become the devil. So now he's evil. He tempts e uh, Adam and Eve. And so somewhere between Genesis 131 
And uh, Genesis 3 might be the time when Satan and the angels fell, but we can't be sure of that. I'm just giving you a little sanctified speculation there. <laughs> now, let's talk about the battle that we're in. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. We wrestle not. The word wrestle is competition. It is the war that we're talking about because we call it a war because God said, put on the armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And so he says that later on there. So what is spiritual warfare? You hear people talk about spiritual warfare. Some overplay it, some downplay it. We want to get a biblical view of what spiritual warfare is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we are wrestling against principalities. You see the word prince in that? Those are demons who have power over certain geographical areas. And we can prove that from Daniel 10. And then powers. And then rulers in that world. And then spiritually wicked beings who operate in high places. Ephesians 6 and 12. So we have the forces of evil there, wicked, malevolent, violent, foul. Every adjective that I can think of is inadequate to describe the evil. And then you have the forces of righteousness, God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the angels, and Christians, the saints, we're the forces of righteousness, and we're locked in this cosmic battle that's been going on, and it's been going on all these years. And let me tell you what Satan's goal is. This becomes very practical at this point. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 with me in your Bible. This is why you need to know what I'm preaching about why you need to heed it, please don't forget it. That's why I've studied a lot to give you a lot of information because I believe the battle is intensifying like it never has in the past. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober about this. Be vigilant on guard. Your adversary the devil. You have an enemy tonight. Know your enemy because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And Satan is compared to a hungry, roaring lion. And he's going up and down the earth. Do you remember when he appeared before Job, uh, before God about about Job, then God said, where have you been, Satan? And he said, I've been going up and down to and fro across the earth. I've been going to and fro across the whole earth. And what's he going to and fro for? He's seeking whom he may devour. That's you, the saints. If he can get you to neglect what God has told you to do, you're helping him. If he can get you to get into an area that God has told you to stay out of, he's helping, then, then you're helping him again. If you're blind and numb and passive about your spiritual life, he's got you right where he wants you. He's like a lion who sees prey, and he's going to attack you. And the battle is going to intensify. If you believe, as I do, that we're living in what the Bible calls the latter times, the end of the age, the last days, the Bible says Satan is going to step up his attack. Because Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12 says he knows that his time is short. He's running out of time. He knows what the Scriptures say. He knows, and he's going to intensify his efforts. 
1 Timothy 4 and 1 talks about, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith because they will give heed to seducing spirits. He uses that term seducing. And the doctrines of devils. 1 Peter 4 and 1, I believe that is. 2 Peter 3 and 1. And in the last days, it talks about, and the term is there. And Revelation 12 and 12, he knows his time is short. Lastly and quickly, where's the battlefield? If you don't know where the battle's being fought, then you're, you're, you could become a casualty. The battlefield is in your head. It's right between your ears. It's not a big expanse. It's not a physical place. It's not a bar or a brothel or all that kind of thing. That's not where the primary battle is being fought. That's the flesh. The battlefield is between our ears. It's our thought life. It's in our own heads. We, walk, we go around with it all the time. Proverbs 23 and 7, you know that verse. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If Satan can get into your head, he has you. Understand? The battle's right here. The battle's not the temptation for me to commit adultery. The battle's not the temptation for me to go out and get drunk. Or to get mad and hit somebody and assault them. That's not the battlefield. That is the flesh. That's my old self. That's the world that entices me into these things. The battle spiritually is right here. That's the battlefield. Listen, reason with me. Whoever controls your thoughts controls you. When Satan can get in your head, he's got, you, he's got all of you, the mind. It's the power of education. You understand now why Satan has such a grip on the colleges and the universities and the secular world today? That ought to be our motivation for Christian education with our children. Is if Satan gets their, into their mind... He's got them. He's got them. You say, I don't know if I believe that or not, preacher. Well, go to Acts 5 and 3. Don't go there. Just write it down. And Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira, why hath Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Why hath Satan filled your heart, heart being your whole being? Satan can fill people's hearts, their minds, their thinking processes, and inspire them to do evil. He didn't make you. He didn't put a chain on you and drag you. He just gets you to think that way. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 is another reference. The God of this world hath blinded the minds. See, there's the battlefield. He's blinded the minds of them that believe not. His strategy, right there in your Bible, it's the text passage, Ephesians 6 and 11, the wiles of the devil, that you'll know how to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what I'm trying to prepare you to do as a Christian living in the last days, to understand and recognize because Satan has one strategy. It's the same strategy he's used throughout the year. He wants to deceive you. He wants to deceive you. That's his goal. Deception, lies, deny the truth, distort the truth, make you blind to the truth, the truth of God's Word. And the first weapon that it says that we're to put on in the armor of God is what? Truth. So, We go to our Word of God. We go to our Bible. And our primary and first weapon is to understand the truth. You don't get rid of Satan by casting out demons. You don't always even get rid of Satan by prayer. You get rid of Satan 
by understanding and knowing the truth. Sound, sound doctrine is your weapon against Satan today. Don't feel down as you leave here. I sure don't want you to do that. Revelation 12 again and verse 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the cross. How do we overcome Satan and fight back? And I'll have a whole message on this. But I just don't want you to leave today thinking that Satan can overpower you. He cannot if you're a, if you're a Christian living for the Lord. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's the cross. That's the atonement. That is depending totally upon what Christ did for you at the cross, the gospel. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. They don't have a lot of stuff in their life that's wrong. They have, their testimony is good. It's clean. They're not compromising with the world and the flesh in their life. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto the death. They didn't put the things of this world above living for Christ. They would give up their very lives. They would become martyrs before they would sell out the Lord Jesus Christ. 496 years ago, Martin Luther wrote a hymn. It's the best single thing I've ever read on dealing with the devil. Look at the words of it with me. He describes our spiritual warfare. The mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft Deceit and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide that our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath is his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this earth with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, amen, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, and one little word will fell him. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. And let our goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still, and his kingdom is forever. Amen. Our heads are bowed.